Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming out for Grand Rounds. It's uh, great to be here on this crisp morning, and I'm supposed to be up in the 60s this weekend, so I'm sure we'll all find some fun things to do. In keeping with the great traditions we have at the University of Washington Department of Orthopedics, uh, which is, includes not drinking the Kool-Aid and looking critically at what other people call conventional wisdom, uh, the shoulder and elbow service, uh, yeah, along with Akash, who's a, a member of our service because we like him so much. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the changing paradigm or challenging the paradigms, if you will, uh, that exist throughout the world and our country in some of the aspects of shoulder surgery. So uh, we just like to be different out here in the Northwest and we just don't go along with what everyone does in New York or Chicago or France for that matter. So anyway, these are real great speakers we have for you this morning, well known to you all. And uh, Akash is a, a game changer and a future game changer, no doubt. Jason Shu is uh, somewhat new to our service, but we're thrilled to have him with us. And he's making great contributions already. And uh, Rick Matson needs no introduction here. So without any further ado, Akash. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Warm, and thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, my name is Akash Gutz. I'm a fourth-year resident here at the University of Washington. So when my co-presenters and I came together to give this presentation, we want to do something a little bit different than just review the current concepts uh, in shoulder surgery. Uh, one of the discussions that we had with Dr. Matson uh, was really the role of an orthopedic de academic department. I think that most of us would agree that first and foremost, our goal should be to provide excellent patient care. But part of our responsibility to our patients is to question why we're doing what we're doing and to challenge what we were taught. As others look to our institution to be leaders in thought, it's our obligation to stimulate progress in the field by challenging the existing paradigms within the field. And that kind of led us to this topic here today. So I'll be giving an introduction to the topic as well as going over some historical examples of how our department has challenged the paradigm in the past. Dr. Shu will be looking at some of the recent shifts in rotator cuff disease, and Dr. Matson will be discussing resident iconoclasm. So historically, the practice of medical education has long been an apprenticeship model. And while recently there's been a more shift to a, um, a standardization of education, surgical subspecialties still largely rely on the development of skill and technique uh, through apprenticeship. Um, since there's such varied surgical approaches, techniques, and technologies used to treat orthopedic pathology, frequently the reason why a surgeon does something a certain way is because that's how they were taught how to do it in their training. I think at our own institution, residents would agree that there's sort of an internal culture of how we do things, uh, the Harborview way or the UW way, if you will. I recently went on fellowship interviews for foot and ankle, and every single interview in one way or another made reference to this mythical Seattle way of doing something. And while I think that there are certain principles or even a standard of care that permeates throughout the department, I think pigeonholing it into a Seattle way would sell a little bit short. There are several examples within our department of individuals embracing our role in academics and really challenging the firmly entrenched beliefs of orthopedics that have changed the way that we practice today. A few examples. For a long time, femoral shaft fractures were treated with, with traction and bed rest. And of course, there were several um, complications with a deconditioned pa patient lying in bed for several months, including pneumonia, DVTs, and PEs, among others. In the 1940s, a German surgeon, Kuncher, started treating American POWs with intramedullary nailing. However, his, work, his early work was not uh, very well received, um, and by the end of World War II, his techniques were largely undiscovered in the United States. A Time Magazine article in 1945 discussed the skepticism of American surgeons on finding uh, these intramedullary rods implanted into American soldiers. Even through the 1950s, as he developed the shape of nails as well as the technique of intramedullary reaming, the use of intramedullary nails in the United States was largely unknown. 
Throughout the 1960s, there was significant enthusiasm for compression plating in tibia and femoral, uh, femoral shaft fractures, and the concept of intramedullary annealing sort of fell by the wayside. But as the complications uh, of open femoral compression plating became apparent, intramedullary annealing was revisited by a few surgeons here in the United States. In 1966, Dr. Hansen spearheaded the decision to establish a closed intramedullary nailing program here at the University of Washington, whereby one resident would spend six weeks observing Kuncher's technique. A program was then established whereby community orthopedists would allow their patients suitable for nailing to be treated by the residents while they assisted and learned the technique. They subsequently collected and published a series of 46 fractures treated with intramedullary nailing and found very few complications, most of which were transient or functionally insignificant. Patients were allowed to weight bear as tolerated, and they found, it, they found no infections, mortality, or non-unions, with signific significant improvements in time to crutch watch walking and full weight bearing compared to their compression plate counterparts. This, of course, was part of the revolution in the, U in, the, in the U.S. that sparked the progress of nail designs and techniques. As we all know, reamed intramedullary nailing is now a gold standard of treatments uh, of femoral shaft fractures today. But it took revisiting a concept that had previously fallen by the wayside and had been dis dismissed as lar at large by the orthopedic community. Another historical example of this department's ability to shift the paradigm looked at the effects of elevation and compression in a uh, in a limb. Compression and elevation have long been used to treat um, in an injured limb, and the effect of elevation in the treatment of swelling is undeniable. However, in a series of studies, Dr. Matson and his colleagues decided to challenge this and see whether elevation could actually be harmful in a compressed limb. In this 1977 JBJS article, the team replicated a compartment syndrome model by applying air splints to their own limbs uh, with, with increasing levels of pressure and varying levels of elevation. They found that the ability to tolerate pain in the compressed limb was reduced by limb elevation and that a decrease in local arterial blood pressure was a significant um, contributor to this decrease in pain tolerance, not just the increased compression. They followed it with this article in the 1979 edition of CORE, which uh, measured both the arterial and venous pressures in compressed limbs uh, at varying levels of elevation. In this study, they found that both arterial and venous pressures decreased with elevation, but that the arterial pressure decreased, continued to decrease with progression of elevation above the level of the heart, while venous blood pressure could only be lowered to the local tissue pressure. They thus concluded that elevating the limb above the level of the heart reduces the AV gradients in limbs, and this was magnified in limbs uh, with increasing tissue pressures, such as those with compartment syndromes. And finally, the team went on to publish this 1979 core article that measured the oxygenation of tissues in compressed limbs while varying elevation. Predictably, they found that muscle oxygenation was decreased in compressed limbs, which is a phenomenon we all know about compartment syndrome. But they also found that oxygenation of tissues was uniformly lower in limbs that were elevated above the level of the heart. The combination of these three studies uh, showed that elevation of a compressed limb uh, decreases pain tolerance, decreases the AV gradient, as well as decreases muscle oxygenation. They established that elevation, while it's a useful tool in managing the swollen and traumatized limb, is not done without consequences, and that orthopedists should understand this physiologic effect. So these are just a few of the examples of our own department challenging the pre-existing paradigms. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Shu, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the current shifts in paradigms as it relates to rotator cuff disease. Thanks, Kosh. For those uh, that haven't met me, I'm uh, Jason Chill. I'm one of the new additions to the shoulder and elbow service here. So I'm going to be talking about recent paradigm shifts in our understanding of the rotator cuff disease and focus on the last 10 years of what we've learned about the rotator cuff. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, so the rotator cuff is widely debated. It's a very controversial area in orthopedics. And despite thousands of articles that have been published in the last couple of decades, we still don't really have a consensus on many of the issues regarding the pathogenesis and the management of rotator cuff disease. Um, like many of the things in orthopedics, our decision making has been based on expert opinion and level five evidence. For example, uh, for over 40 years ago, Nier proposed this theory of impingement syndrome, uh, where the anterior third of the chromium strikes against the rotator cuff 
causing disease uh, and suggested removing the part of the chromium that caused impingement. And for decades, a lot of surgeons were using this diagnosis uh, of impingement to perform acromioplasties. And in the 90s and 2000s, the rate of acromioplasty had doubled or even quadrupled in many of the database studies. Dr. Madsen and the group here published a recent paper that demonstrated that many of the assumptions about impingement syndrome have not been supported by any literature in the past few decades, and that impingement syndrome is really a nonspecific diagnosis, uh, that with our current advanced imaging techniques, we can better characterize it by specific diagnoses such as bursitis, cuff tendinopathy, partial tears, full thickness tears. Um, and this is just one of many questions uh, regarding the pathogenesis and management of rotator cuff uh, tears that we have. Uh, here are some others. Um, do tears initiate in the anterior supraspinatus? For a long time, we've uh, understood that rim rent tears at the anterior supraspinatus uh, are where uh, cuff tears start. Does location matter? Do, um, how often do tears propagate? Uh, when does the muscle start to atrophy? And most importantly to the surgeons in the room is when should we repair these tears? So management of the rotator cuff tears are um, one of the most controversial topics in orthopedics. Uh, we have a lot of different treatment options, uh, very little consensus among surgeons on what we should be doing. Uh, there's a lack of agreement on when we should be maximizing conservative care and when we should be considering early surgical intervention. So by studying the natural history of uh, uh, rotator cuff disease and understanding and characterizing the risk factors for tear progression and irreversible changes, we can better understand these implications for operative uh, intervention. So one of the big problems with studying the natural history of rotator cuff disease is that when patients present to our clinic, they're usually symptomatic, and so we're obligated to, uh, to treat them, whether it's with physical therapy, with injections, or with surgery. Um, Patients with asymptomatic tears, so that's, um, when patients come with symptomatic tears, their natural history is interrupt, interrupted by treatment. On the other hand, patients with asymptomatic tears have little pain, they have good function, and so clinical, no clinical intervention is necessary. So if we can identify these patients with asymptomatic tears, we can follow them over time uh, without disrupting the natural history. Um, of the disease. And we can study tear prevalence, we can study development of pain, and we can uh, study tear progression. One issue that arises is how do we identify these patients with asymptomatic tear since patients with, without symptoms are not going to show up to our clinic. Um, one solution is to image both shoulders in a patient that presents with only one painful shoulder. By imaging the asymptomatic contralateral shoulder, we can identify these tears. As you can imagine, imaging an asymptomatic uh, shoulder, particularly with MRI, can be expensive and timely, but fortunately we can use ultrasound of the shoulder. Uh, as an accurate, quick, and inexpensive way to uh, image uh, an asymptomatic shoulder. So, um, the group at Washington University has used this, uh, particularly in re the research setting, uh, and they've used bilateral shoulder ultrasounds to study the natural history of rotator cuff disease. Uh, they performed bilateral ultrasounds in almost 600 patients uh, with unilateral shoulder pain, and in these patients that had full thickness tears, what they found was that the majority either had a partial tear or a full thickness tear on the other side. This study also showed that there's a strong correlation between the presence of a rotator cuff tear and the increasing age. There's a 50% chance of having a bilateral cuff tear after the age of 66. In fact, if you look at the average age of patients with no tear, unilateral tears and bilateral tears, there's almost a perfect 10 year interval between each of these with no tears in the late 40s, uh, unilateral tear in the late 50s, and then bilateral tears in the late 60s. And this supports the notion that cuff disease is not due to impingement, but rather is an uh, age-related degenerative uh, phenomenon of the tendon. In addition to the increasing, uh, increase in cuff disease with age, there's also a decrease in cuff healing with age. Uh, if you pull all the studies looking at cuff healing, the average age for a healed cuff is probably around 55, and the average age of an unhealed cuff is in the early to mid-60s. So there's a drop-off uh, in the body's capacity to heal tendon to bone at that age. If we have a patient that presents to us in the mid-50s with pain in a small tear that we treat conservatively, uh, and that patient is seen 10 years later with new pain and enlarged tear, by that point, the patient's capacity to heal that tear uh, has been compromised and may not be repairable. So when that patient initially presents to us, we have to ask ourselves, what's the risk of tear enlargement? Uh, 
what's the risk of fatty uh, muscle degeneration? What's the risk of alterations to glenohumeral kinematics? Because it's these irreversible changes that can dictate our urgency for surgery. So understanding the location and the initiation of degenerative tears uh, is essential to describing the pathogenesis of the rotator cuff disease. And early theories in the general accepted concept of tear initiation was that uh, the tears start just adjacent to the biceps tendon at the anterior supraspinatus and progress posteriorly to the infraspinatus. But by using ultrasound, the group at WashU has been able to challenge this uh, this uh, generally accepted concept. Um, this is an ultrasound of the rotator cuff. Uh, we have the uh, deltoid superiorly, the humeral head inferiorly. We have the biceps anteriorly. This is a sagittal cut here. And then you can see the rotator cuff tear here. And with ultrasound, what we can do is we can measure the distance from the biceps to the anterior part of the tear. Using data from hundreds of degenerative rotator cuff tears, a histogram was constructed uh, describing the frequency at which uh, a certain distance from the biceps tendon tear was involved. And the highest frequency was about 15 millimeters posterior to the biceps tendon. This histogram included all full thickness tears. If tears started at the anterior edge of the supraspinatus, you would uh, expect the curve to uh, the, the highest frequency to be at uh, zero, to zero millimeters from the biceps tendon. In order to make sure that there wasn't a bimodal distribution of frequencies for small and large uh, full thickness tears, a similar histogram was made for small full thickness tears, and we saw the same frequency. The highest frequency was about 15 millimeters posterior to the biceps tendon, and this confirms that uh, degenerative tears actually start more posteriorly than we originally thought. So instead of the tear starting anteriorly, we understand that tears start more posteriorly and then progress anteriorly and posteriorly from there. Anatomically, this makes perfect sense because um, if, you, if you've heard of the concept of the rotator cable and the rotator crescent that was described by Burkhart, uh, the, the rotator cable is a thickening of the tissue that starts at the anterior supraspinatus and involves the, uh, uh, it spans the uh, supraspinatus and the infraspinatus tendon. And lateral to this rotator cable is what we describe the, as the rotator crescent tissue, which is a thinner, less vascular uh, tendon. Um, and the site of initiation of uh, uh, rotator cuff tears on ultrasound studies correlates to an area that's towards the middle of this rotator crescent tissue. And this is the most avascular area of the cuff insertion. Here's a cadaver picture demonstrating this concept. Uh, anteriorly here is the uh, biceps tendon. And you can see the thickening of the tissue here as the rotator cable and then the thinner crescent tissue lateral to that near the cuff insertion. And at 15 millimeters posterior to the biceps tendon, um, you can see the initiation of a cuff tear in that exact area described by the ultrasound studies. Around that same time, there were some anatomic studies that expanded our understanding of the rotator cuff insertion. And the generally accepted concept was that the cuff insertion uh, of the cusp insertion was at the supraspinatus uh, inserted onto the anterior part of the greater tuberosity and the infraspinatus behind that. We were taught in medical school by our uh, Gray's Anatomy and Netters that the uh, supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres reign in parallel and their fibers uh, ran in parallel onto the greater tuberosity. This study challenged that notion, and we now understand that there's considerable overlap of the structures and that the supraspinatus by itself only has a very small insertion onto the greater tuberosity, and the infraspinatus actually has a, uh, a large, uh, covers a larger portion of the greater tuberosity than we originally had uh, um, thought. Uh, I put new in quotation marks here because it, it wasn't necessarily new as gross and Microscopic studies done uh, by Doug Harriman here had shown that there are considerable overlap between the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. If we look 15 millimeters posterior to the biceps tendon where tears initiate, according to these anatomic studies, uh, this actually correlates to an area of the anterior infraspinatus or posterior supraspinatus rather than the anterior supraspinatus as we had originally uh, understood. This might be explained why sometimes we can see isolated infraspinatus atrophy and, uh, in, in small tears. With this new understanding that tears start 15 millimeters behind the po uh, biceps tendon, one of the questions was, as the tear progresses anteriorly and posteriorly, um, 
it's going to propagate towards this uh, anterior supraspinatus or rotator cable. Uh, with the loss of this cable, the question was how important is the integrity of this anterior supraspinatus? Uh, this study looked at the location of the tear, specifically addressing the question of what is the importance of this anterior supraspinatus. If we look at the tears that occur more than 10 millimeters posterior to the biceps tendon, uh, a large majority of the tears have no supraspinatus degeneration, which is shown here in blue. If we look at the tears that are uh, more than zero but less than 10 millimeters from the biceps, ten, uh, biceps tendon, there's no degeneration as well. But if we look at the uh, tears that are right behind the biceps tendon, um, and once it once the tear hits that uh, area of the anterior supraspinate, the majority of the tendons have fatty degeneration. If we look at the same thing with the infraspinatus tendon uh, and muscle degeneration, we see the same pattern with a small proportion of degeneration at greater than zero millimeters behind the biceps tendon, but once it hits that anterior supraspinatus, the majority of degeneration uh, will occur. Therefore, we can be fairly confident at this point that the integrity of the anterior supraspinatus is uh, important to the development of fatty atrophy. Um, so if we see a young patient with an anterior supraspinatus tear, uh, we have to be cognizant that this is, a, this is a tear at risk for irreversible fatty degeneration. So now that we understand uh, tear initiation and the importance of tear location, what about tear size? Uh, we can follow proximal humeral migration with x-rays to detect uh, kinematic changes uh, in the glenoid humeral joint. And when used along with ultrasound, we can determine whether there's an association uh, between tear size and altered kinematics. And this study showed that um, tears of about 175 uh, square millimeters were associated with migration and painful shoulders and 175 square millimeters is approximately a 15 by 12 millimeter tear. Um, lastly, what have we learned about tear progression? Um, over the past decade, the, the group at WashU has been prospectively enrolling patients in a longitudinal study uh, with the purpose of um, reporting long-term risk of uh, tear enlargement, symptom progression, and following these asymptomatic tears. And the most recent report was just published in JBS with over 200 patients with a symptomatic cuff tear on one side an asymptomatic tear on the contralateral side. And over the past 12 years, they followed these with ultrasounds, uh, with x-rays, uh, and with clinical exam. And what they found was that tear progressed uh, more than five millimeters in 50% of patients by a median of 2.8 years. And if we look at full thickness tears, they're more likely than partial thickness tears to enlarge. And full thickness tears were primarily the only tears that really were associated with muscle degeneration. So over the past 10 years, we've learned a great deal about the natural history of rotator cuff disease. Uh, we know that's often an age-related tendon degeneration, not, not really impingement that's causing, uh, that the, that's caused, uh, causing the rotator cuff uh, disease. Um, we know that there's a smaller supraspinatus footprint than we originally thought, and that's actually the infraspinatus that's taking the majority of the greater tuberosity insertion. Uh, tears initiate 15 millimeters posterior to the, to the biceps tendon rather than at the anterior supraspinatus. Um, the anterior supraspinatus is key in fatty atrophy. Um, altered kinematics can uh, occur at tear sizes of about 15 by 12 millimeters, and about 50% of degenerative tears uh, will increase by more than five millimeters at an average of 2.8 years. So the question now is how can we apply this to our patients? So in the patient that presents with a small tear in their mid-50s, we have to worry that if we treat this non-operatively and they come back 10 years later with new pain and enlarged tear, at that point it may be irreparable. So we have to take these natural hit uh, history considerations into account. With tear initiation 15 millimeters posterior to the biceps tendon in the crescent tissue, uh, if we see someone with a tear in that crescent tissue that doesn't include the anterior supraspinatus, uh, we can maybe follow them over time, um, treat them without surgery, but pe patients with an anterior supraspinatus tear that involves a rotator cable, we have to be cognizant that they're at risk for fatty degeneration. And we also understand now that tear sizes, uh, you know, if, if they're greater than 15 by 12 millimeters, uh, the larger the tear size is, uh, the more kinematic abnormalities the patient may have. So it may be better to repair these small tears while they heal better at a younger age. One of the big questions now is, can we reverse the natural history with surgery? Dr. Matson and the group here um, 
has looked at the uh, literature over the past uh, 20 years or so and looked at uh, the number of publications on rotator cuff uh, repair. And although the number of publications has increased a large amount, uh, we can see that uh, the post-op outcomes and the integrity of uh, the repairs really hasn't changed that much over time. So this question is something that has yet to be uh, answered at this point and hopefully as Dr. Matson talks about uh, in his talk, um, hopefully there will be someone up here in the front that will help us to answer those questions. So, thank you. You can see why it's exciting working with uh, these people. So, we're going to continue the theme of challenging the existing paradigm and I'll submit to you that that's what we do here in Washington. You know, we, we try to change the way transportation is done. We try to change the way music is done. We try to change the way business is done. We try to change the way mountain climbing is done. We try to change the way people with renal failure are managed. The way people with bone marrow failure uh, and um, uh, myeloproliferative diseases are treated the way people that are hurt are managed, the idea that you may be able to come up with some orthopedic trauma implants that are actually affordable and that you can have quarterbacks with style even though they are shorter than average. So uh, I wanted to highlight the role that resins play in challenging the existing paradigm and uh, we all are fans of disruption and so I'm going to present to you sort of a 40 year look back over 24 disruptive papers by 23 residents of the University of Washington residency program and so you all know that Keith Mayo was one of our residents here and also we uh, had Jeff Sheridan unfortunately he's passed away but they were sentinel in challenging Challenging the existing paradigm about compartmental syndromes because in the earlier days back in the 1970s everybody was thinking this was due to arterial spasm and they were able to help generate this model here shown in the bottom slide which really that one little picture explains all of the findings that you have uh, surrounding compartmental syndromes for example how the pulse can be intact how the finger and toe tips can be uh, well perfused but the compartment can be ischemic and Akash has touched on the fact that this model helps understand why elevation is a bad thing for people that have compartmental ischemia. So again, hats off to Keith and Jeff. Rob Veith uh, uh, was uh, instrumental in our understanding of compartmental syndromes in children, increased pressure in a limited space, and uh, for a long time the paradigm was, well, we should just watch these uh, kids along and see how they did. But he pointed out in this uh, important paper that uh, time is of essence in saving the viability of the muscle it, within the enclosed compartment. Joe Zuckerman, uh, one of the first papers that, uh, that was written here about shoulder stuff, pointed out that uh, hardware can create problems around the shoulder. And uh, the question that he brought up is, do you know where your screws and staples are tonight? Because they can migrate around. And this message has not necessarily percolated through the entire environment because this is a case we just saw last month with loose screws and staples. But again, Joe wrote this paper while he was a resident here. Um, Bill Barrett, uh, you, many of you know him um, from his practice down in Renton. Uh, really was one of the sentinel people that introduced the concept of patient-derived outcomes. And even though now it's on everybody's lips, the idea that you do uh, patient-reported outcomes, this is one of the first papers that he did along with uh, a slightly younger-looking Sarah and a slightly younger-looking Rick Matson and our patient Ron Baugus, who uh, had a wonderful outcome uh, in terms of his own self-assessment going back to elk hunting after his shoulder replacements. But it was the idea that more than range of motion, more than strength, more than any of these fancy scores. It's how the patient really felt that their shoulder was doing that gave us the key to understanding how to best treat them. John Franklin, a um, good friend of Dr. Hansen's, can Bill Barrett uh, 
sort of helps us understand that uh, the problem of glenoid component failure and introduce this now quite uh, well uh, publicized idea of rocking horse loosening so you can see that when the humeral head is no longer centered in the shoulder the edge of the glenoid is pushed on causing it to rock loose in the past all the models of glenoid loosening had to do with what its pull off strength was and uh, John and Bill were able to show that it was actually this rocking horse mechanism that was the most important way that uh, shoulder glenoid components got loose uh, Dr. Uh, Shu has already mentioned uh, shoulder ultrasound, but it was actually back in 1988 that Mike Gannon, uh, one of our residents, talked about sonographic evaluation of the rotator cuff, and it really in, one of the first people to introduce the idea of using sonography uh, rather than at that time the gold standard, which was arthrography, to uh, evaluate the integrity of the rotator cuff. And at that time, we just had me mechanical sector scanners that we stole from the OB department to look at uh, the, the rotator cuff, but now with linear arrays that has advanced a lot and the people at Wash U where Jason came from uh, have really taken that to the next level. But the idea that uh, we can evaluate the rotator cuff without having to do arthrography or MRIs was sentinel at that time. Steve Thomas, um, uh, one of our residents, uh, published this paper on uh, the arthroscopic, on not arthroscopic, but anatomic uh, reconstruction of shoulders that were unstable. And up to that time, a lot of people were doing things like tightening the front of the shoulder using putty plats or magnesium stack procedures. Um, but he was able to show that with good anatomic repair, just sewing back the ligaments where they were torn off the front of the glenoid was in most cases sufficient to restore stability to the shoulder and people still talk about the, the Thomas technique which is involving drill holes in the anterior glenoid and uh, passing those sutures through the trailing medial edge of the capsule and restoring the fossa deepening effect of the glenoid labrum. Randy Viola and uh, Craig Boatwright uh, were able to uh, challenge the idea that it didn't matter whether uh, someone was hurt on the job or not and able to show that people that were hurt on the job had much uh, poorer self-assessment compared to people that were not giving us an idea that uh, being hurt on the job is a comorbidity and uh, not just with shoulders but with all of orthopedics. Ren McAllister um, again demonstrated that uh, you could in fact get great results with rotator cuff repair without doing a, an acromioplasty and that was a brand new thought because everybody felt that uh, acromioplasty was a mandatory part of rotator cuff repair and we've learned subsequently that if the coracoacromial arch is preserved that can help preserve function even if the rotator cuff fails because it provides a ceiling for stability of the glenohumeral joint and many patients can continue to function well as long as this um, stabilizing mechanism is not sacrificed. Joe Lynch and Jeremiah Clinton and uh, Dr. Gilmer uh, were sentinel and uh, Dr. Montgomery also in showing that actually you could get a great result from a shoulder arthroplasty without having to put a piece of plastic in the joint and that patients given the opportunity can regenerate as the red arrow shows a normal fibrocartilaginous covering for their glenoid and create in effect their own glenoid arthroplasty once the surgeon uh, reams the glenoid to a nice uh, spherical concavity. This is one of Dr. Warm's patients six weeks after this procedure uh, and how much is he been pressing now? Over 300 pounds. Over 300 pounds. This is without a glenoid. You can imagine what would happen to a piece of plastic if uh, he was trying to do that uh, with um, uh, a total shoulder. So again, credit to these residents uh, who were able to push this concept forward. Mike Lee, uh, the resident, as opposed to Mike Lee, the attending, uh, was able to demonstrate that uh, dropping a reamer down the inside of the humeral canal can actually ream the bone eccentrically because of the oval shape of the medullary canal. And we often miss this because we look at the shoulder from an AP standpoint usually and misjudge how wide the canal is. And when we take an 
an axillary view, we can see that it's actually narrower than it appears, and inadvertently we can weaken the uh, humeral canal by uh, reaming the bone eccentrically and give rise to the potential for fractures. Scott Hacker uh, um, was able to demonstrate the effectiveness of impaction grafting, which has now become our standard method for fixing humeral components in the medullary canal, uh, avoiding the problem that Mike Lee had shown previously of narrowing the, uh, the cortex by reaming. Uh, instead, uh, Scott helped us understand the concept of impaction grafting, where we do minimal reaming and then use bone harvested from the resected humeral head to achieve fixation by press fit without the problems associated with, bless you, without uh, uh, trying to achieve a tight fit by broaching or without using uh, bone in growth prostheses or without using cement. So you can see that you can get a nice uh, fit of the prosthesis inside the medullary canal without using any of those other techniques making the, the risk of fracture uh, minuscule after uh, the restoration of the humeral anatomy. Dr. Howe uh, uh, provided us with a sentinel paper showing that uh, even though we think that we've got a lot of sutures in there that's going to distribute the load in a rotator cuff repair, that each of these sutures is loaded differently in different positions of the arm and so that it's important to recognize that uh, when we put a lot of sutures in there we are distributing the load but for example in external rotation it's the anterior suture that gets the majority of the load, in fact 70% of the load so it cautions us that uh, we need to be careful with our rehab early on until biological healing has taken place rather than depending on the sutures to, um, to support the load. Pete Scheffel and uh, Dr. Wider uh, were able to uh, assail this uh, very important concept. We even had a, uh, a guest lecturer here not too long ago who said we don't know what the etiology of chondrolysis is. It's probably a surgeon problem. It's probably multifactorial. The etiology is speculative. There was an article in JBGS and one, and one in the Journal of the AAOS that said we don't know what the etiology of chondrolysis is and these gentlemen were able to show that it was in fact the pain pump that uh, infused local anesthetics that was responsible for the huge majority of these cases of uh, chondrolysis which is a devastating complication occurring most often in young ladies who had instability repairs associated with suture anchors so again uh, they showed that the etiology was not speculative but could actually be put on this and there was a major lawsuit having to do with this and it got uh, Dr. Wider a little bit scared when he was uh, being subpoenaed to testify here but uh, showing a little bit of the challenge of challenging the existing paradigm. Sometimes it's risky to get out there but uh, now it's uh, pretty well established. Soren Olson was able to show that we need to be careful when we're reaming. Uh, the traumatologist knew this a long time ago that you got to make sure that you have sharp reamers and that you keep things cool. But he was able to show that uh, using infrared photography at the time of surgery that you could actually heat up the glenoid bone to the levels where the bone could be killed um, so that it's important that glenoid reaming be done in a way that keeps everything cool. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, who you met, was able to show that uh, the current trend of getting CT scans on everybody having a shoulder arthroplasty uh, is unnecessary and that that exposes a patient needlessly to expense and to radiation. If one can teach the uh, radiology technicians to take a good axillary view, that provides all the information you need and uh, that this extra expense and uh, exposure is not necessary. And finally, uh, Clifford and Akash um, were able to show that half the cases of aseptic loosening of the, uh, of, of the shoulder, for example, the loose glenoid component shown here, are not in fact aseptic. And if you take uh, appropriate pains to culture the tissue from inside the shoulder, you'll find that uh, upwards of 50% of these are culture positive for propionobacter. So, the synthesis of all this is that residents 
have and will continue to play a critical role in challenging the existing paradigm here at the University of Washington. So we can sort of throw this challenge out at these folks here, uh, including you, Adam, there, uh, that you know, take on something that you're not sure is right. Uh, Dr. Zerhouni said uh, when he gave his presidential address uh, that uh, half of what, everything you're taught is wrong. The challenge is to figure out which half it is. And so with that, I will leave you and uh, thank you for the opportunity for saluting our residents that have done so much to help us challenge the existing paradigm. Thank you.